Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Connie Bolin. I'm the founder of Warbirds in Review and the coordinator uh, But this crew that we have inside the building. For those of you who are out front uh, of the Quonset Hut building here this morning, we are hiding inside the building with our crew all set up here with the gentleman who will be presenting uh, this morning. My job is to thank our sponsors, First Scott's miracle Grow Company, who makes this uh, presentation possible, and to Ron and Diane Fagan, especially this morning where we have a nice green room where we normally brief and then we come out in front of the crowd. But today we are inside because of the inclement weather here in Wisconsin, and the aircraft is also in a, a nice covered area. So unfortunately, we cannot have the airplane here, but if you'll uh, hang with us here, we're going to have some great footage of this beautiful airplane Thunderbird. We're gonna tell you about the history of it. And again, we thank Ron and Diane Fagan for this building that allows us to present this and uh, have you view us on the uh, Jumbotron. Uh, and um, here shortly, right after the video, I will be introducing Brigadier General Ed McElhenney, who is our moderator today, and then he will introduce our guest again to feature the beautiful aircraft Thunderbird. Uh, I am um, very pleased to be a female aviator, or an aviator at all, actually, uh, is what really matters. Uh, and follow in the footsteps of a lady, Jackie Cochran, who was the owner of the featured aircraft today at one point in time. I'd like to read just an opening to tell you a little bit about Jackie and the uh, history. This opening is in uh, her book that was published in 1987. Jackie Cochran left an indelible mark on the history of aviation. At the time of her death in 1980, she had more speed, altitude, and distance records than any other pilot, male or female, and no one has ever matched her achievement. Today, I am pleased that Warren Peach has preserved our history of Jimmy Stewart, Jackie Cochran, and the common man, but I'll let, I won't steal Warren's thunder in uh, his uh, line here. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, being here. Those of you who are in the audience uh, here live at uh, Oshkosh, and those of you watching, but if you will direct your attention now to the Jumbotron and the video, we have prepared the introduction, and then we'll get on with the program with uh, General McElhenney introducing our guest. Thanks for being here. Thunderbird. In Native American mythology, it is supernatural, being of immense power and strength. To car buffs, Thunderbird embodies classic styling and prestige. Power and strength, styling and prestige. The aircraft before us today has all of that and an exciting history as well. It is a North American P-51C Mustang, saved from the military boneyard and assembled from the parts of three separate aircraft and countless spares. This aircraft won the 1949 Bendix Air Race and set a series of speed records in the early 1950s, records that remain unbeaten 70 years later. But the real story of this airplane is about the people, famous and not so famous, who have been part of its history. From a 10-year-old boy daydreaming in North Dakota, to Queen Elizabeth II, and from war heroes to Hollywood legends. 
Leland and Martha Cameron were the owners of Allied Aircraft of Chicago, Illinois. In the late 1940s, the Camerons bought the parts to build and modify the P-51C. The Civil Aviation Administration, forerunner of the FAA, registered the airplane in April 1948. Two days later, the Cameron sold it to the Joe DeBona Racing Company, which was owned entirely by the Hollywood star Jimmy Stewart. During World War II, DeBona flew thousands of hours in the Air Transport Command, ferrying B-17s across the Atlantic. The partnership between DeBona and Stewart had one goal, to win the Bendix Trophy. Air racing was popular in the late 1940s, as popular as NASCAR is today. And the Los Angeles to Cleveland Bendix Trophy race was among the most popular events. Jimmy Stewart was the first Hollywood star to enlist in the armed forces after Pearl Harbor. He trained as a pilot in the Consolidated Aircraft B-24 Liberator Heavy Bomber. And flew 20 combat missions over Germany as the leader of a B-24 squadron. He rose to Brigadier General in a military career lasting 27 years. Preparing the P-51C for the 1948 Bendix Trophy race included removing bits and pieces to save weight, adding more streamlining to the airframe, installing an experimental propeller, and applying 48 coats of primer and cobalt blue paint. They named the airplane Thunderbird. DeBona entered the 1948 Bendix race in Thunderbird, but ran out of fuel 63 miles short of the finish line. In 1949, DeBona and Thunderbird finally took the trophy with a record-setting average speed of 470.14 miles per hour. It was the last year that the Bendix race included piston engine aircraft, and DeBona's speed record still stands today. Three months later, Stewart sold Thunderbird to Jacqueline Cochran for one dollar. Jackie Cochran was an accomplished record-setting pilot. She had won the Bendix Trophy in 1938, and she was the first woman to pilot a bomber across the Atlantic. On the street, in the home, in a crowd or alone, shout wherever you may be. But she was most celebrated as the founder and director during World War II of the Women Air Force Service Pilots, better known as the WASPs. Cochran recruited more than a thousand women pilots, designed and oversaw their training, and managed their service during the war. WASP ferried military aircraft of all kinds, from factories to training fields and embarkation points, and they served as flight instructors, all of which freed up men to fight the war. Over her long career, Cochran set many speed records in piston-driven aircraft and jets. She said of herself, it never dawned on me not to do something because I was a woman. She would eventually set more speed records than any other pilot in history, man or woman. She set three of those speed records in Thunderbird before selling the Mustang back to Jimmy Stewart in 1953 for $1. Stewart repainted the airplane as Mr. Alex in honor of his father, Alexander Maitland Stewart. In March 1954, 
DeBona flew Mr. Alex from Los Angeles to New York City in just under four and a half hours, setting a new transcontinental speed record of 561 miles per hour. Six months later, Stewart sold the Mustang to James Cook, a Texas businessman. Cook used the airplane to seed clouds for rain. In August 1955, the Mustang was written off after a crash landing. Cook survived, and what was left of the airplane went into storage. Warren Peach grew up in a flying family. His father owned a flying service in Minot, North Dakota. Warren took over the business in 1990, repairing and restoring aircraft. As a 10-year-old boy, Warren had vowed that he would own and fly a Mustang someday. As a pilot, he flew warbirds with the Texas Flying Legends and the Dakota Territory Air Museum, but he still wanted a Mustang of his own. In 1999, Warren bought a wrecked P-51 in Nebraska. When he discovered that the wreck he now owned was Thunderbird, he decided to restore the airplane to pay homage to Stewart and DeBona. As the work began, the Mustang was badly damaged and corroded from chemicals. The long process of restoration was finally completed in 2023 and the airplane will be housed at the Dakota Territory Air Museum and operated as a flying piece of history. And how is Queen Elizabeth part of Thunderbird's history? Well, that's another story. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ed McElhoney, and uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to be the rudder that steers the ship here today in this program. I apologize, first of all, for uh, not having the aircraft uh, behind us. Uh, unfortunately, the weather here in Wisconsin did not cooperate, and with such a val valuable aircraft as this, uh, we decided to be uh, somewhat conservative. Um, you can see three gentlemen off to my left here, and what we're going to be talking about uh, those of you who are out on the ramp right now, you can see that, that sign that says History, Heritage, and Heroes. Um, and we're going to touch on all three of those today. Um, quick introductions. The good news is that we'll have a little bit more time for discussion today because, um, yeah, we don't have the walk around. We're not going to be able to look at the aircraft, which I suspect we'll be able to sometime during the show if the weather cooperates, because um, it is an absolutely gorgeous aircraft. Um, to my left, owner of the aircraft, Warren Peach, okay? Um, he's gonna be doing most of the talking today. Um, you saw him briefly in the slides there. Uh, next to his left, we've got got Chuck Cravens. He's our fact checker today. He's going <laughs> to be the guy, if we start telling stories, he's going to wave the flag and he's going to go, no, wait a second. No, this is really how it is. So he's going to be our, our expert in that regard. And then the last <laughs> guy's just a pilot. Um, <laughs> just I'll, a I'll pilot. harass Bernie a little bit. Bernie Vasquez, um, probably one of the high time warbird pilots in the world, um, flown a little bit of everything. And I'd have to say, most hours, uh, has anybody else flown uh, the Thunderbird besides yourself at this point? Only guy who's flown the Thunderbird. So uh, he's going to talk a little bit to us about uh, the Thunderbird and, uh, and its, its current uh, performance characteristics. So with that, uh, I'll get on. And Warren, I'm going to say first, thank you for being here and thank you for what you've done with this aircraft. It is uh, just, just spectacular as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's got a history uh, that's uh, that long, um, and you know most of it. Uh, and I'll just uh, I'll start with a, a quick question. Okay, where did it come from? How did you acquire it? We know that you wanted to always fly a P-51 and own a P-51. Well, you've made it happen, okay? And, uh, and, and, and how, did it, how did this particular aircraft come into your being? Well, it started in 1999, as the video said, uh, in search of, of a P-51A because Jerry Beck at Tri-State Aviation was developing P-51A program where he was going to build 10 airplanes. And 
and I had hoped to build the second one, and uh, Jerry and I were on our way to Cleveland with the Corsair and a TBM, and we stopped in Oshkosh and talked to Gene Chase. We had lunch with him, and when Jerry was telling him about this, and Gene said, well, he said, I think I know where there's some paperwork for a P-51A and, a, and some wreckage, and he described the accident that up in Scottsbluff, Nebraska, and he used to work for James Cook, Gene did, and uh, so I went hunting for that, you know, eventually over the next couple of years, and found out that, in fact, his story was accurate, and that, that there was an airplane up there, there was some paperwork, and I found out that it wasn't an A, but you know what, halfway down the road, let's go ahead and keep pursuing this and keep going, so it turned out to be a P-51C, and then I learned that it was, and I've always liked Jimmy Stewart. I mean, this is this is about restoring one of your heroes' airplanes and uh, his military record, his Hollywood persona, everything about him was pretty cool. Who didn't and like it, Jimmy Stewart? Exactly, <laughs> but but to be able to say that that now I had his his airplane that he owned was pretty cool. So the, so the project really started in 1999. This particular project. I want to back up a number of years. My dad, Alfred Peach, built a Starduster II in 1967. And uh, when I was 10, we followed him down to Rockford to the EAA convention. He was flying that airplane, and we were, the family was in a Mooney. And I was in the back seat, obviously, because I was 10. And I saw P-51s for the first time, and I don't remember how many there were, half a dozen of them. And one of them was, had stars and bars on it, and the rest of them were civilian airplanes. And, and Bob Hoover flew, and I went home and painted a picture of a P-51 on the, my bedroom wall with an opaque projector. I'm not an artist, but anyway, I, I painted this, and I started dreaming. And the dream, you know, ebbed and flowed through the years, and but it never did stop. And I was able to fly other people's airplanes, which was really, really uh, an honor for me, and I'm very happy with, with the people that helped me get into the industry. Jerry Beck, Bob Odegaard. Dr. Hank Reichert, and there's a number of them that, that allowed me to fly their airplanes. So it kind of came and went, came and went, and uh, and then in 2017 I sold uh, part of our FBO and uh, with the intent of retiring. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> and that uh -huh. money, and that How'd money. that work out? Well, Thunderbird is now my retirement. <laughs> so anyway, that so that's where where that airplane came from. But you know, the the a ten year old boy influenced by Experimental Aviation Association in Rockford, Illinois, before the convention moved to Oshkosh, and then and it just kept going and going and going. And so that's that's where that that's the story behind the project. And, and when you found it, you said it was an airplane. It, Bits and pieces, parts. Bits, bits I mean, and pieces. It was, was yeah. It. it it had, as it said, you know, it had crashed. Yeah. Uh, you know, but uh, it was there, and and there was stuff that we could work with, and we obviously the airplane, as so many of them, I won't say obviously, but there's there's pieces internally in the airplane that are original North American pieces, but a lot of the structure has had to been reconstructed, which I think is true with with just about any restoration that you see out there, you know. How long a restoration process? How long did it, it take? Well, we went, we bought a, another project and were able to get the wing from that project and some other parts in 2019. And so the airplane was basically structure complete. And then we moved it to Air Corps in June of 20. And that's how long it's been in, I don't know what you'd say, completion or assembly or whatever, but that's that's where, you know, Mark Tischler and the whole Air Corps, Air Corps group, group, group <laughs> excuse mm -hmm. me, has been so uh, beneficial for me because they have the expertise and the talent to do the things that I certainly couldn't do. And when was the first flight? When did you first fly this thing? Uh, a month ago, wasn't it? A June, month ago. June 6th. Yeah, June 6th. June 6th. Right. All right. D-Day. So, so, so it's not very long ago, and uh, <laughs> and no. here we are. Yep. Well, well, thank and you for and that. A, and the paint is extremely fresh. The painter, Roy Kiefer of Custom Aircraft Finishes out of Castleton, North Dakota, thank you, Roy, is here right now over in the Weeks hangar. Mm -hmm. He was detailing the airplane this morning for us because the clear was put on a week ago today. Okay. So when it came here... Bernie and I brought it down Sunday. Uh, it came here and 
it was still drying, gassing off, and everybody that walked around the airplane could smell it. And so I, I, I don't know that there's going to be an article, but if there is, I think they should title it, Did You Get a Whiff of That Blue Mustang? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. uh, and and you know, talking about the blue Mustang, I mean, it was highly, highly polished back when it was a racer, right? Same color, basically. It's close. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, that thing was just gleaming. And, again, for speed, right? I mean, that, right. Was, that was why well, they the, did it. Supposedly, the... F was it 48, 48 coats, of, coats. Paint of lacquer paint increased the speed by eight miles an hour. Wow. And and again, like you talked about, he ran short of gas, just short of Cleveland in 48. So he was doing everything they could to get that airplane to not only win the race, but, but to extend its range and, and things like that. Uh, I think, yeah, so the finish that we put on it is not the same as they used then because I'm interested in not repainting the airplane every year like <laughs> they were doing. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. but it is a really, really pretty finish, and it's it it replicates the the uh, sheen of the original airplane, I think, to a T. Our shirts are, are close. Okay. They're pretty uh, close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice shirts, too, by the way. <laughs> All right. Um, how about let's let's get into the history of the airplane a little bit. And and you know you talked about Jimmy Stewart. We talked about Jackie Cochran. Um, there's 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 story after story after story. It seems. And uh, and and that's what you want to represent here with this airplane. It, it absolutely is. And and thanks, Ed. And again, I, just to back up a little, thank you for Warbirds and Review for hosting us and having us here. It's an honor to be here. Uh, representing this airplane and it's frankly it's an honor to have this airplane here to represent those three stories and for it to debut in vintage aviation it was I apologize to Warbirds <laughs> but it was a it was a vintage, vintage airplane. it was I a vintage it. racer yeah. and, I, and, I, and I'm kind of a vintage guy at heart but it was uh, you know it never had a gun in it so it never fought in yeah, the war yeah, and, and everything and uh, there's so the, the the representation or the story that I'd like the airplane to be recognized for is not only how pretty it is and the records that it set, but the three people that flew it were representative of World War II veterans, great Americans, patriots, all. And it, it kind of, in my mind, starts out with Joe DeBona, who was a World War II ferry pilot, veteran, who had a dream of winning the Bendix race. He raced it in 47 in Magic Town, he raced in 48 in Thunderbird, and he raced in 49 in Thunderbird and won, and still holds the piston-powered record for the Bendix race. Common man achieves his dream. Jimmy Stewart, another war hero, commanded men. He was an actor before the war, enlisted, as the thing said, he was a, a commander of the Thunderbird squadron, B-24s came back to Hollywood and was a conservative. So Hollywood was conservative. Jackson Cochran holds more records today than any other aviator in the world. She was a patriot. She started the WASP. She did all these things. Women were equal. So the three things that I see the airplane representing for a great time in America after the war is the common man could achieve his dream. Hollywood was conservative and women were equal. And, it, and it, I think it's it's important to look at the airplane and understand what's involved in there. You know, the Queen Elizabeth II coronation films, that was a pretty neat race, too. So That came from what? Uh, on that coronation thing, it was from uh, Canada? They were flying the canisters down, weren't they? Uh, no, they, they were, the Mustangs were. The yeah. Pony Express was from coming from Goose Bay okay. to Boston for the two different networks. CBS okay. is what Mr. Alex flew in, the Thunderbird airplane. Okay. Uh, and then Paul Mance's airplane, who they, uh, they obviously had some sort of a little uh, contest going on between Mance and DeBona and, and Mance's pilots because DeBona had lost to Mance in 47 and 48, and then Mance's airplanes lost to him in 49, so they re-ran that race, and they lost again. Because Chuck can kind of fill us in a little yeah. bit on that coronation thing. How well, it was work? essentially a, kind of a publicity stunt in a way. It, it's television history, really, because there had never been an event televised in the United States that happened overseas on the same day. 
And of course, there's no satellites, and it was. Um, oh, this is 1953. Three. Okay. It was uh, possible to do it with a with an undersea cable, except it would take up the whole cable. So economically, that wasn't feasible. So the RAF flew the what we would now call videotapes to Goose Bay and uh, Canberra, and they also flew them on to Canada. Uh, the two Mustangs picked up their copies for their network. Um, and flew to Boston to try to be the first ones to put that on the air, the same, the coronation, the same day. Mm -hmm. So, and it is the first time that that's happened. Um, the other network realized that Thunderbird was going to win, so they punted and <laughs> got coverage from Canada and actually got it on the air first. But Thunderbird won the race. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about the airplane a little bit, and I'll, I'll go down to Bernie now for a minute. Um, you know, point to note that, you know, from, from, from the onset, you know, I mean, you did several engine runs probably on the thing, and, and it, did it start and, and run perfect the first time? Uh, were there little things uh, that, that went wrong? Uh, what do you think about that, that side of it all? It went uh, very well. It, there's always teething problems in a project. You never ever start anything and get it the first time. Mm -hmm. But I will say, this is the f fourth airplane we picked up from Air Corps now. Okay. And they just keep getting better. Good. Um, it was pretty effortless out of the gate. We did all the ground runs, got it all prepared. And, I mean, it was, they do a good job of, of all right. I've done yeah. quite a few test flights this year in different airplanes and, for different companies, and uh, it's impressive. Okay, and let's talk about the first flight. Um, went well, no big issues. Um, it wasn't one of these, hey, airborne, uh-oh, I got a problem, come right back down and land? No, I'll, I'll do exactly what I did on the first test flight. I, he was behind me, said brake release. I let go of the brakes, ran the power up to take off power, and it broke ground. Wanted to wait just a little bit to get the gear up in case there was a problem. Elected to put the gear up and started climbing, setting a deck angle for the speed I wanted to climb at, which was about 130. Mm -hmm. And it was so impressive, I keyed the mic. Because all of the Air Corps guys were on a radio listening to us. I just keyed the mic and went, yee-haw. Because <laughs> I've never been in a Mustang ever that performs like this airplane. Okay, it's yeah. light. They've taken... Just like that picture showed during the Bidnix race, they took everything out that would have been, quote unquote, a stock Mustang, which for Air Corps guys, it was hard to build the airplane. Because Mark Tissler told me at one point, the guys would bring this restoration package over and say, okay, all this needs to go in the airplane. And he'd look through it and take one bolt and go down, the rest of that stuff's got to go back on the shelf. He said, well, no, no, it goes in the airplane. He said, it's a racer. It's a racer. That was... It was hard because they're so used to building everything totally authentic mm -hmm. that it was just they, it was a it was just a funny thing to watch happen. But the airplane stripped down at sixty seven hundred pounds. Uh, an H model was like right there, I think, mm -hmm. and the H model was the biggest performance had all the performance back then. You know, it was an interceptor made to take off and go climb. This thing does that. And it's really, really, really. It's a impressive. stock motor, right? I mean, this is completely a, stock. Okay, Glenn, so, so Glenn Wagman the built motor. the motor. So every th all the performance that you're getting is from from a weight reduction and paint job, and and so so that's what's what's giving it the speed. You were talking about coming up here, um, and and you know you you've, again it's unheard of basically. You know you you got how many what you said forty. 40 knots more than, than typical Mustang? Yeah, 30 to 40 knots more at the same altitude. We were 11.5, 36 inches, 2,300 RPM. Normally, you'd see 220 indicated. Mm -hmm. This thing's 270. I mean, not doing anything. It's all in trim. I mean, at one point, I took my hands off and went like this, and it's just, it's that fast. Any additional limitations because they've lightened it up as much as they have? You know, say, uh, you, you know. They yeah, I'm worried when I do the air show that when I do the top of the, when I come over the top for the Cuban 8, that I'm going to be too high. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No big deal. <laughs> no. No, there's uh, it. They race the high backs 
for a reason. We fast forward 50 years, you know, when I worked quite a bit on Voodoo uh, as a younger person um, on the crew, did a lot of the work modifying it, put back on the race turtle deck, which tells you right there that they took the bubbles off in the 60s, 70s, and 80s and put these little turtle decks on to get the air to flow back faster. So a high back airplane's faster anyways. Razorback P-47, a Razorback Mustang, they just, they're just faster, you know, but you can see why they did a D model because you can't see out of these things. You know, you, you're, every time you turn, your head hits something. Yeah. That's just one of the limitations. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> All right. Well, sounds like a great flying airplane. I'll say that right now. And again, I wish we had it out here and uh, I look forward to, to walking around myself. But Warren, more uh, more stories about the, uh, the the history of this airplane. You know, uh, the, the Jimmy Stewart, he sold it to Jackie Cochran for what, a dollar? I, I mm. think is, you know, and, and then... One in OVC. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, so. and, and, and did Jackie want it to set records? Is yep. that, that was That was her goal. Yeah, I think Absolutely. this was the third Mustang that she'd owned, right? I think so. Yeah, and and raced. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and just to just to back up real quick to the first test flight, Ben Redman and I were behind him, and I was was allowing him to get airborne and the gear up completely before I took off because I, I wanted him to have their own uh, D model Mustang. Okay. And in my opinion, our fastest D model Mustang at the museum which turned out to not be quite fast enough for this particular mission, I guess. But I don't know. But anyway, the the funny part was is we briefed it. Okay, I'm going to let you get the gear up before we go because if something, there is a problem, I want you to have all the runway to use. I don't yep. want to be competing with you. Yep. And so I'm coming around the corner while he's adding power, and I see the wheels break ground, and he goes a little ways. And he said, pull the gear up. And I'm busy in the cockpit for a second, and Ben's, saying, yeah, the gear's up and stuff, and he goes, yeehaw, and, and uh, I'm looking out there about where a, a normal Mustang would be mm -hmm. at this point, and I don't have him in sight, and Ben <laughs> says, gone. look at that thing go, <laughs> and he goes, yeehaw, and I looked up like this, and I went, wow, it's really climbing, <laughs> and so, and then the chase began. <laughs> wow. wow. Yeah, but anyway, so the, the history on the airplane, I, you know, um, the, the video seemed to carry it pretty well. I don't know if you This you was never your intent, though. When you bought a Mustang, you sat there, and I just want a Mustang. And then all yeah. of a sudden you found that, hey, you've got Thunderbird. I, I got, it, and it, it has met my expectations and, and exceeded them, this whole project, the whole time. And I'm so happy with the whole thing right now. I, I think these guys will tell you that at, at uh, Texas Flying Legends, they had a nickname for me, EFD. Eternal face of disgust. Out of everybody in this group right here, I've known him and worked with him the longest. I've never seen the mustache curl up. <laughs> it's always a frown. So, and so people keep asking me, well, it, is, he must just be totally excited. I said, have you ever seen his mustache go up? <laughs> and it's been like that for yeah. 20 days now. Alex, since the, fir yeah, since I, the first flight. I can't say that I see anything wrong with the airplane. I think the paint job is is phenomenal, and the scheme. I mean, it's uh, when you look at that up on the screen now. Oh yeah. Um, that's a retro paint job. That's 1949, and them guys absolutely nailed the scheme as far as proportions and and beauty and stuff. As we painted the airplane, and and I vacillated. These guys will tell you I vacillated over that blue for years and in the last six months it was like every pickup every car everything i saw six well that months? must be the blue that must be the blue you know six months <laughs> yeah. <laughs> every phone call and, and we have phone calls i live in california he lives in north dakota three to five times a day we're back and forth and it, it got to the point where it would about the color nope oh that's just about business just mm. friends oh, okay. calling each other okay but every time the phone rang, I'd answer it, go, yellow and blue, yellow yeah. and blue, yellow <laughs> and blue. And then Eric Hokuff randomly, as the paint job is happening, I mean, they're laying paint. Oh. Eric and his crew and the guys start looking at these black and white photos, and they go, the rudder's not blue. What do you mean the rudder's not blue? It's black. The checkered flag back then was yellow and black. Mm -hmm. 
they painted it and it was a discussion internally. He called me and I'm like, I, I, don't, I think that's going to look horrible, but if it's the way it was, paint it. That was the biggest home run for this airplane. Yeah. It, yeah if it was nice. blue, it just wouldn't look today. Uh, and all the artist renditions were blue. Yep. It actually, it was, as Bernie said, as it was painted, and they started questioning it. And I went back. I've been collecting photographs and stuff forever with lots of cooperation from uh, Air Racing Historians Association. And there was the one color picture, and they blew it up, the blew up the rudder, yeah. and then you could see it. And you can go back and look at the black and whites, and some of them look like the checker, the dark checkers are blue. Mm -hmm. And I think what probably happened is they probably were blue mm -hmm. and got painted black before the race. Mm -hmm. And that's a real common thing to have happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other thing that about that color or, or look is so many photos, black and white photos of the airplane were available, but we couldn't see the blue from yeah, that obviously yeah, yeah. but we were trying to gauge what what shade blue is is it light blue is it dark blue whatever it is because some of them were gray and some of them, look at that one you know up in there it yeah, looks like yeah, it's yeah. dark blue go. right yeah. well we found a color that changes with the light yeah. and that's what this one does and i i stood out there on the line the other night as the sun was going down in the smoke and i i just kept watching it and it just kept getting darker then not the light, but I mean the color just kept getting darker and darker throughout the evening, and I was like, "Man, it really worked." And the, you know, and then the stripe down the side. Do you see the stripe around the back windows, and then it goes up over the the exhaust stacks to that emblem, the Thunderbird emblem. And we really worked on that in the paint shop. Yeah. Roy and Bruce, and we kept looking at it, and looking at it. And if you look at it, you see that in the original pictures, it had a little curve to it, and it and it and we replicated that curve here, and we kind of figured out why they did it. There's there's some certain pieces in the airplane that lend themselves to going around to make that mm -hmm. that curve happen. And uh, and I, I finally was trying to describe it to them guys. I said, I don't know what it is, but it looks like the end of a signature where yeah. you just kind of yeah. accelerate yeah. away from your name oh, as you're mine. doing yeah. something, you know. But it's 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 a neat look, yeah. and and hats off to the guys that painted it into Air Corps for the stencils. But that little emblem that's up in the front of there, that Thunderbird, is all painted. It's all masked and painted, and it took yeah. a day and a half for Bruce to do that. He'd lay down a mask, paint a color, peel that off, lay down another one, peel out the next color, Yep. And the Pegasus horse is the same way, you know. So all the trim you see on that airplane uh, yep. is all painted. How to grow delicious tomatoes. Step one, feed them while watering with miracle Grow Liquifeed. That's it. miracle Grow. All you need to know to grow. Talk a little bit about the Pegasus horse. You know, I saw it on my shirt. I'm kind of going, yeah. uh, and, and, and you said, oh, that's a, it's a, go well, ahead, it's, Chuck. It's, it's a trademark symbol for um, mobile oil. Okay. And uh, sign collectors, that's a sign that's really sought after. You know, they used to have big ones on gas stations. But it's a pretty um, pretty identifiable logo. And uh, okay. very, very they, they created uh, some special gasoline 150 um, octane to increase the horsepower. Um, I've read, and I don't know this for a fact, but I've read they were getting 3,000 horsepower out of it for the race. Did they? They provided the gasoline for the race. Okay. And and who? Somebody had the story about uh, you know uh, they ran out of gas 53 miles mm -hmm. short at the one time. And it's obviously we want to get as much gas in that thing as possible. And tell me the story about the uh, the dry ice. Well, I, there's a picture, and I. Yeah, I didn't provide it to these guys, but there's a picture of it at, at Rosemont Lake Bed of an old gas truck. Obviously, it was new then, but uh, and there's canisters that they're lowering into the top of the truck that are full of dry ice, and the airplane had a wet wing, mm -hmm. and so they had covers off of the out in the tips and and at the leading edge of the wing, and they're putting that cold gas, which we all know shrinks. Yeah. Yeah. Into the, the airplane and then putting the covers on and putting them shut so they could launch right away and climb into cold air mm -hmm. and keep the gas from expanding. And, and it kind of gives you an idea how 
single winded Jody Bona must have been about, you know, I ran out last time. I'm not doing it again. It's extreme. <laughs> and, I mean, yeah. this is, you're, you're so, taking it to the extreme here. Yeah. And as much gas as you yeah. can get in there. So yeah. It's very interesting. But it's cool. It's a cool idea. Yeah. Well, they, I agree. they had the wherewithal to do it, and there weren't any regs keeping them from doing it. So, yep. one of the other things, and I don't, did you have, more Keep stuff going. Here. I got. I got more questions. So if they could go back to that picture that showed the anvil. The anvil. Yeah, I'd say it's like the most, the asked, most asked question, question. It, with oh, the least the amount of answers. Yeah. yeah. But okay. I. But I have a couple of theories on there. And the 1853 anvil that's below the left side rear window, when you look at the airplane, there was a 1853 anvil chorus, and one of the guys at Air Corps, I, yeah, I did. you, yeah found this and said, you know, it was written for an opera. And Glenn Miller did a swing tune of that 1853 opera. And I, Glenn Miller and Jimmy Stewart were friends. Glenn Miller died yeah. during the war. Yeah. Jimmy Stewart played him in a movie, the Glenn Miller story after the war. So I think that might have been, you know. Uh, a tribute a, of sorts. Yeah, acknowledgement, yeah. a tribute. And, uh, and and the lyrics in the in the opera to me kind of say what Jimmy Stewart was thinking because when you read the book Mission in there Jimmy Stewart was he was PTSD we didn't have that word but he was traumatized by that war yeah. he kept his men's morale up he was a great leader but he was obviously really affected by the weight that he carried as a leader during that war and he was tired of killing people and seeing his parents get killed and he and he associated that, he associated with airplanes with that, with that. and there's a, there's a paragraph in the book that says there was a day where he said, I'm never going to fly again. Mm -hmm. He told somebody that. Mm -hmm. I think he came out of the war. He was a pilot before the war. He loved aviation. He started the, the Thunderbird airfield in Arizona, you know, with some other actors and stuff. He was, and so he, this airplane, I think, was something that made him happy. He, he he could associate happiness with airplanes, and so the lyrics in that opera were basically "Gypsy Maiden, it's time to quit morning, it's time to celebrate, take yeah. off your dark clothes, mm -hmm. put on bright colored clothes, and stuff." So there was that. Mm -hmm. The second theory I have on the on the anvil is his grandfather started their family hardware store in Indiana, Pennsylvania, in 1853. And the anvil in the mid 1800s was the emblem for a blacksmith shop, mm -hmm. and I think a blacksmith shop and a hardware store were yeah, pretty much the same, the same thing, yeah. you know. So, so I don't know. The, there's a romantic version, and there's a simple family of recognition version there. But uh, there, and and now I don't have to tell that story to anybody anymore because it just kept happening over <laughs> and over and over. <laughs> we were going to put a sign out by the airplane. The anvil will be told every half hour <laughs> on the hour. <laughs> Because it seriously is, you know, we're sitting around the airplane and, hey, excuse me, do you know, what the uh, what's the animal with it? Uh, to go talk to the guy in the yellow hat. <laughs> <laughs> it seems yeah. like so many symbols on the airplane have dual meanings. I, I And I really like that because that's the way I, I think. Yeah. I look at something and I go, well, that's synonymous with this, but it if also we were going to do it the this. way you think, we'd have like 40,000 emblems <laughs> on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well. yeah, EFD. Mm -hmm. How about the future? Where's it going? What's it going to do? Uh, you going to fly it some more? It's going to go back to California. Okay. It's going to live in my hangar. <laughs> and I'm trading him a North American Navy on him. So he still has a North American. Uh, uh, nice try, but it, but it, Yeah, I don't think it's going to work. Nice but but, but I want to. But Navy on's brightly painted. At least it's got that going for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's going to live in the Dakota Territory Air Museum, and it'll get campaigned okay. uh, around the country, and people will get a chance to see it. Yeah, it's really nice right now, and I'd love to keep it that way, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to make it a hangar queen. You're going to fly it. Yep. Okay. Yep. Good. And so, um, that's that's what I see the future of the airplane, and and I'll and I'll I'll fly it for however many years. I'm not going to put a limit on it, and. And when uh, when that's over, I'll look for uh, a new caretaker for the airplane to keep okay. to keep it going. Go ahead, Bernie. Oh, well, I'll, I'll oh, be the oh, caretaker. You're, you're volunteering. <laughs> what you're yeah, yeah. And yeah. and uh, to go way back, this this airframe never flew in combat. This was this was Correct. this is not a war plane per it, se. It was being it, delivered from Dallas 
with 11 other airplanes. So there was 12 airplanes, I think, total. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, to be shipped to the Pacific Theater, China, Burma, India, whatever, um, and had a landing accident in Palm Springs and was was abandoned there until after the war. And uh, I'm thinking that Jimmy Stewart had some pull with the DOD and some mm -hmm. different people, and so they ended up with this airplane, and it's... Yeah, its you know, original airworthiness was as a... There's stories racer. about it being... There's, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, was, it was built in 1948 was, and assigned a serial number. So, yeah. yeah and it's it, not it a an air racer. It's not a serial number yeah. that has anything to do with a North American or Army Air Force serial numbers. It, it doesn't make sense for either of but those. That palm, but say, that, that, palms, that Palm Springs airplane is that... But that number is in that serial number, and they dropped a couple numbers yep. at the beginning of it, yep. and that's that's what I think happened. And it and I it would only make sense. Why would you build a Mustang when there was all of those airplanes available after the war? Yeah. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, take they one went. And they just went and picked one. Yeah. And said we're going to strip it. Yeah. And it's what's funny is the airplanes have several different serial numbers, and so they're easily confused. Yeah. And that airplane, you know, it. It's, that's why the whole story about it going down a vintage is it really never was what we know as a warbird. Sure. It, it, it never made it to the war. Yeah. It never left U.S. soil. Yep. It got built in its civilian world for one purpose. Mm -hmm. They wanted to go do the Bendix. Yeah. And then they did it and then had its unfortunate accident. He finds the pieces, links it all together, yeah. builds it. I mean, he originally wanted an A, builds this thing back to what it was, yep. and now we're here with it trying to display. And what's cool about this airplane is the he brought it up before with the the common man, the war hero, the records it set. Yep. And when you look at it now, it's the we're repeating the history again. Yeah. You know, the whole the whole thing it's it's owner dark. pilot yeah yeah girl <laughs> <laughs> and, and trophy trophy we can't hey, forget yeah, the trophy yeah. there too yeah um, this yeah. thing uh this is a replica of the bendix trophy that would have been given to the oh, pilots the that won just put that in the dryer and it shrank yeah <laughs> <laughs> the the actual traveling bendix trophy was never given to a winner and it's on display at the wright patterson museum and so yeah. and it has the plaques on it of each year's winners mm -hmm. on there but this this is a bronze replica, replica of the trophy that joe de bono would have taken home with him how many years uh, chuck okay this is a question how many years did they have the air races any idea um, well, the, you know, the Bendix was connected to the Cleveland Air Races, right. and I believe that began in the early 20s. Mm -hmm. um, the 49 race was, th there was a tragic event, and it ended the Cleveland Air Races, and that was what the Bendix flew from L.A. to, to Cleveland. Um, the Mustang Beguin, uh they lost control, crashed into a house, and, and killed two people, a mother and, a, and their child, and so that was kind of the end of the Cleveland Air Races. Mm -hmm. They did run the Bendix, but really from 49 on, it was kind of a military jet race. Um, like Warren said, there was no more. It wasn't run with piston engines right. again. So no. this one, this airplane won the last the Bendix race. Correct? Last well, piston. The piston, last piston, piston yeah, powered yeah, piston, Bendix yeah. race. And that's why the record still stands. Yeah. Yeah. It also set a transcontinental record. And, you know, the, the speeds are a little unbelievable until people consider that those are across the ground speeds with hellacious tailwinds because mm. oh, yeah. the trans the transcontinental record is 560 miles an hour and you know you're not going to fly that mustang at 560 miles an hour at sea level in mm -hmm. in still air so yeah. now the, the cleveland not? race i read the other day they s said that the tailwind averaged between 8 and 18 miles an hour so it, it was mostly mustang at yeah. altitude yeah. that was doing yeah. that yeah. And, and if you, you look at you the picture think about of it, that now they're running the course at reno with way more hopped up engines asking way more out of it i mean these guys essentially had stock engines yeah they had 150 fuel from mobile mm -hmm. which we get ours from uh i can't even think of it right now but we get high octane fuel for reno but it's 50 years later and we're not going any faster yeah 
granted we're on a close course a round course and down low yeah so the true air speeds aren't there yeah they could but, be the yeah. the uh like when you look at some of the pictures of the airplane taxiing in at cleveland there's a black streak all the way to the rudder post and yeah. the tongue's hanging out on that thing. So you know he never came off the stop in that race. It went yep. to altitude yep. and and yep. stayed there the whole time. How old was he when he won the race? Any idea, uh, Joe? I'm not uh, sure. Okay. Um, he appears to be in his 40s in yeah. the pictures. Okay. Oh. Yeah. And it went, well, maybe late 30s because, I mean, he was in the military in the war. Yep. yep. He was probably only 25. The war might have aged Yeah, him. so I... Yeah. <laughs> It aged a lot of people. All right. I, I have a question about the questions. Are we going to have an opportunity to do questions? Is my we, we are. There are some folks out there that we can, uh, and I'll, I'll, okay, I'll open it up. And I think we're going to try to stay in here. I think that's the best. But if there are questions out there, I think we've got a microphone that can be uh, passed around. And I see Bruce out there. I think that's Bruce. Okay. And uh, we've got a question. So let's, let's let the questions roll. Where will the uh, airplane be displayed uh, for the rest of the uh, event here at Oshkosh? All right. Hard to hear. Let's see. Can Where will the airplane be displayed for the rest of the convention? Where oh. will it be displayed for the rest of co the convention? Warbirds, right down here at the end of the pavement. Okay. Uh, down where, the, where they see that pylon that's set up behind the Barnstormers apparel. So, okay. so the airplane will be right in front of that. Okay, so it'll be there when the weather cooperates. We'll we'll leave it at that. Anybody yeah. else? Any other questions out there? Gentlemen, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, did Jimmy Stewart actually fly uh, Thunderbird? I not, have, not that we're aware of. Well, actually, <laughs> that's not true. Really? I have that Western Guns article that the kid, the kid's dad was an actor. Western actor with Jimmy Stewart, and he talks about his dad had an air coupe and took him out to the airport one day to have a meeting with Jimmy Stewart, and Jimmy Stewart taxied in a blue Mustang. Really? Yeah. Okay. I go. haven't seen yeah. that article. Yeah. I've <laughs> been looking. Yeah. Right. <laughs> one up on Warren. He's, he's the fact checker now. <laughs> All right. I didn't know that one for sure. The airplane appears to have a D model wing on it. Uh, can you tell me why? A D model wing. Yep, I can. Um, when the airplane originally had a problem with James Cook, it was because the gear was trapped. And C models, and Bernie, correct me if I'm wrong, but C model wings were inferior to D model wings in the fact that they only had one uplock on, on the clam doors, and I think it was at the back of the clam doors. And they had a little bit of history about... Uh, at speed, the doors coming open and the gear coming out and, and a wing coming off the airplane or something yeah, like when, that? Uh, in the early stages of P-51 existence, they originally didn't have uplocks on the clam doors, and they had a couple instances where the gear didn't make the actual uplock, and under G, the gear came out. So then they mm. modified them, and they put uplocks on the clam doors, to fix that, but sometimes those were problematic on the early airplanes, and so this particular airplane ended up with one yeah. main gear out, the tailwheel out, one main gear hung. The guy must have been a little inexperienced or probably just didn't care because there was a thousand of them out there. So he elected to climb to altitude and jump out. Any of us would have put the gear up and bellied it in and would have done a lot, lot less damage. And I, I knew that Bernie was going to be flying at an air show, so I wanted the best possible wing, strongest wing we could put on it. So, he, <laughs> but, yeah, so, but so to know. answer the question and, and make a long story really short, it's got a D wing because the landing gear system is better, yeah. in our opinion. There's yeah. going to be a thousand people that argue it. Well, and there's, there's a thousand different ways to skin something. This is just yeah. what he chose to do. North American chose to, to improve the gear system, and I would rather be that way. And they actually built a C model with a D wing on it, and they they tested that airplane. And in the process of putting the bubble on top of the airplane, I'm sure they elected, well, let's just keep the the B C production line going, and we're going to transfer it over here to that and live with what we've got. But uh, that's the reason for the D wing. And uh, and actually, I I haven't flown it, but I kind of think the D wing with the combination of the C fuselage is 
is maybe a little faster than a than a C, and it and it's a little better approach speeds. It's because of the the extra can of leading edge on it and stuff. It may. It Why may do you put a brand new aluminum big block in your Chevy? Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> it's better. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. So anyway, that's the answer for the yeah. DUA. And you know, we kind of got a local expert here who's got landing Mustangs with only uh, let's see a tailwheel and one one. Uh, yeah, I think Connie. Connie, didn't you have that problem? Uh, what? <laughs> yeah, but Warren, but Warren you, wants you to learn. Check YouTube. And you make yeah, but we we yeah. want to know now. Right here, by the way. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the good news. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. just wanted to let you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, any other questions out there? No, it looks, looks like we're, we're good. All right, I'll ask the panel here. Anything more you want to bring up about... Uh, you know, when, it, when the airplane gets over here, I'll be standing next to it. And okay. Happy to field some questions and, and really hope people come and enjoy the look of the airplane. Okay, uh, and Bernie's going to yeah. be flying it some more here? Possibly, yes. Okay. Um, it There's some scheduling things that may happen or may not happen. Okay. It is scheduled right now for Thursday and Saturday. It may get changed to a P-47. Okay. So we're just kind of... Okay. We're... Flexibility, key to air power. Yep. <laughs> okay. Yep. And for me, it was uh, really an interesting um, airplane to research because all the restorations that I've done or researched for Air Corps and Dakota Territory have been military. And it, this one was completely different. The sources, picture permissions, everything was way different than doing a military airplane. But it was just fascinating how connected that was to history from the late 40s to all the way up to, the, to when it was lost. Um, the coronation and all of that. Yeah. 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 Anything, Warren? I think you covered a lot here. I think we, uh, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful airplane. Um, it's got quite the history. As we started out, you know, history, heritage, heroes. We've talked about all those, and this airplane represents all that. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, I, I thank you for what you've done with the airplane. Uh, I look forward to the, the, the campaigning of it in the future. Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, you know, the more people that see it and understand the story, I, I think the more people will appreciate it. And, uh, and I have one you. request for the people that come see him. Reno, Reno. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's the last Reno. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. I would agree. I think that would be terribly appropriate, you know, if that thing well, yeah. was, was, was out there. I think that, yep, yep. All right. In that case, I'll say thank you very much, uh, folks out in the stands here, for, for being here and putting up with the, uh, uh, the inclement weather. At least it didn't rain, I don't think, out there. And, uh, and yeah, yeah. Um, you gentlemen, I'll say now, thank you. Thank Again, you. Ed. I appreciate yep. the knowledge. Thank you. Safe flying out thank there, you. Bernie, with this thing. And uh, yeah, we look forward. We got another uh, Dakota airplane this afternoon, uh, for what I understand. We've got P47. We got, we got Bonnie, a P47, and that starts at 1 o'clock today. And so that's, uh, and that's where the real originality battle comes, is them guys were restoring this, that alongside this. <laughs> and they were super original on the P47. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. Yeah, when, when go. The guys would hand Tisler yeah. something. Get, no, I don't want that. Doesn't go in here. Yeah, but they want. It. <laughs> right. Anyway, yeah. Are thank you, you. Are you going to be here for this afternoon too, Bernie, for the P47? Uh yes. Okay. I will good. Be. All right. So you'll see him again. All right. Thank you, folks. We appreciate it, and we'll see you this afternoon. <laughs>